and you know, this brings up something really interesting philosophically since class has officially started, you know, <laughs> make sure it's relevant, um, which is, you know, as, as important as experience is to knowledge, right? There's a difference between someone who knows that they're only gonna be in that position for a certain fixed amount of time, right? Like people who go visit very impoverished parts of the world. And then they think that they, you know, really understand what it's like to be without. <laughs> privilege like no you don't because <laughs> you didn't actually live that experience you vacationed in that experience <laughs> for a, a temporary period of time it's, um but yeah so it's like you can take away like certain interesting things from it but it's a very different perspective than someone who's in it all the time but i'll have to keep an eye out. i just joined pinterest that's like my willingness oh, okay. to wade into social media uh, at this point but yeah, I'm sure there's lots of funny stuff out there. And yes, it brings up interesting things. So uh, since we have a lot to talk about, I'll get started. Uh, we'll probably have a few more people join us. But I did want to let you know and thank you all uh, who responded to my email. I didn't get any concerns about sharing the recordings from the class. Um, so I have done that in our Canvas shell. So in that top module, which has information about joining the class. I've just linked the recordings for the previous weeks there. So if you'd like to go back and review anything or if you missed a class um, and you'd like to take a look back at that, um, it is complete in that you get my awkward like waiting for people to join at the beginning. And then there's like, you know, the leftover questions at the end. So, you know, it's not like an edited cool thing, <laughs> but uh, you can use it as a resource in addition to the other, other things. So. Um, let's start off with, again, just big picture stuff with the class. So in terms of our writing assignments, right, this week you are submitting what will be the end of our explain section, right? So this paper in its entirety is called present, explain, evaluate, right? So we've presented an argument by this week. You will have explained that argument in three paragraphs, right? Defining your terms telling a story of significance, and then this week is constructing rationales for each line of the argument, right? Which is why um, if any of you have had maybe longer arguments, I've been encouraging you in the feedback to kind of short, tighten those up, right? Get rid of extraneous uh, premises because we only have one paragraph to rationalize the whole argument, right? So that's why it's really only enough space to do that for two, three premises max, right? So if you have more than three premises, um, you know, I would encourage you to go back and edit that before you take a, a attempt to this week's um, writing assignment or the part of the draft. Okay, so after this week, we're going to enter the extremely philosophical part of the writing assignment known as the evaluate portion, okay? And this is where we get to imagine objections to our own argument in uh, very specific and probably new ways for, for us. Um, and we're going to then respond to those objections. And this will prepare us for a conversation we're gonna have to have in real life or as real as you know virtual meetings are um, in the sense that you're gonna have to find someone outside of this class to have an hour long conversation with about this project you're working on. And this person that you talk to has to disagree with some big part of the project, right? So it's maybe they disagree with your conclusion. Maybe they disagree with one of your premises or starting presumptions. Maybe uh, if you're like presuming a moral framework in your definitions, right? They just have to disagree with some part of the project. And this is going to cultivate um, a lot of difficult and challenging skills, uh, but it's gonna be important for us to strengthen our position, right? So in order for us to be in the best position possible to argue for our conclusion, we have to have engaged with those ideas that counter, right, the things that we're asserting, right? And being able to anticipate those objections and respond to them is gonna put us in a much better position than had we never imagined those objections at all, right? So that's gonna be the remainder of the writing assignments, right, for the rest of the term. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit of switching in terms of the, the mental framework. So any questions about the writing assignments, where we're at, where we're going, how this is all coming along, coming together? Right. Then um, I don't necessarily want to, you know, divvy up uh, Confucianism and Taoism because I just, it, by the nature of these traditions, they're very intertwined. And since we're going to be talking about them both today, I'm just going to open it up 
to questions that we have about either tradition, right? So hopefully we had a chance to look at the origin of these traditions in ancient China, particularly during the Warring States period, right? This is significant in terms of um, the philosophical schools of thought that came out at the time, but not just because they were important at the time, they're still very prevalent in various cultures around the world today, right? Um, most notably, the one of the disciples of Confucianism ended up being the creator of legal, legalism, which is another philosophical school of thought. So it kind of took an extreme of Confucianism, assuming that human nature is not good, <laughs> right? And so we need uh, punishment and reward to incentivize moral behavior in society. And that ended up being a precursor to Maoism and communism in China, right? So again, these, these philosophical ideas are still very prevalent today. They've just evolved over time. So we're taking a look at these. Again, they're not exclusionary of one another. They can work together. But they do make they do have different aspects to their philosophy, and I think an important way to do uh, understand that is in terms of the symbolism of the yin yang, right? So um, I guess maybe we'll start there. So any questions about Confucianism or Taoism in its origins, um, its reliance upon the symbolism? Any questions about the traditions themselves? Yes. This comes from um, a text. Uh, that, you know, I, I can't even say I know the origins of it, um, but it is a collection of interpretations of, it's not even appropriate to call it a text. So it actually used to be in the form of sticks, right? So you had these sticks that you would kind of let fall to, to the ground or to, on a table or on, on some surface. And a big part of ancient Chinese traditions before the Warring States period was to interpret signs from nature, right? So this could be in the way that the sticks fell. It was even in other things like um, they would crack tortoise shells and interpret the cracks on those, right, to tell the future, um, make predictions about things. Um, this became intertwined with uh, astrology over time, right? The way, you know, the positioning of the stars and the moon and the sun and various things. Um, but so interpreting these sticks was a series of uh, symbols or hexagrams, right? So a variation of a straight line or a broken line when sticks crossed each other, right? And these different symbols would represent different, um, it, they would be interpreted differently, right? As representative of different fortunes or, you know, typically it's in response to a question that you ask these types of things. Um, you can still find some of these practices done even in Taoist temples today. Um, they give you these sort of like half, like half crescent um, sort of things. There's two of them and you hold them in your hand and you ask a question and then you throw them very hard to the ground. And then the way that they land, like it has to be a yes or no question, right? And then it tells you something. So a lot of things like this, right? Various um, tools that were very rudimentary, right? But used to interpret, uh, to try to give answers and usually to predict the future, uh, someone's good fortune. And so these were picked up um in the warring states period by the various tradition philosophical traditions as trying to extrapolate what nature is like such that it could have this knowledge right to give us right and so that becomes the Tao itself that yin yang symbol and so you'll see some if you search yin yang and um you might see some versions of the symbol that have those hexagrams around the outside Right, uh, so that that symbolism is very complex in its entirety, um, but that's that's the correlation, right? Is that these are all different elements or forces of nature that we can tap into, right? By cultivating a certain uh, what is referred to as virtue in these traditions, right? We've been talking about it in other schools of thought, like enlightenment, right? You can kind of think of that here. They're not so much interested in after death enlightenment, but how we can make right, this current state of existence better. And so harnessing the forces of nature, right, is going to be the primary way of doing that, right? And so we're going to see two different approaches to that. One is going to be very top down, and one is going to be very bottom up. So which one is going to be more top down in its approach to how they think we should cultivate virtue and become better people, become uh, to create more harmony in the world? 
which tradition confucianism or taoism is more top down confucianism oh, good yeah, helen why do you say confucianism do you know why uh not confucius right that's a very latinized version of the name but Kongza. do you know why he thought that we should focus on the top of the hierarchy why we shouldn't just go to the people, right? The the vast majority of the population and teach them how to be good. Why did he think we should focus on the top? You're absolutely right about the second part, but Lao Tzu is actually uh, the con contributed with the founding of Taoism, right? And so he's gonna be representative more of that bottom up approach, but you are right that for Kongza, it was about focusing on the top person because he thought that he was kind of just going with the practicality of reality, right? Like he he wants everyone to be virtuous, right? In the entire so society. But, right, in reality, he knows that only a select few have access to education, right? And so the idea is that if we're in a society that has this hierarchical structure, people tend to look to the top of the pyramid, as it were, for their role models, as you were saying, right? And so if he can focus his energies on making the role models good people, he thinks it will have this like trickle down virtue effect, <laughs> right? <laughs> we talk about trickle down economics. This is trickle down virtue, right? If we have people at the top modeling good behavior, yeah, trickle down morality. If we have it them being good, then the people who don't have access to education, right? Where do they go to, to figure out what to do, right? Well, they'll look to the people above them. And so it's not that he didn't think, um, you know, the common person was capable, right? He's just going with what will have the greatest effect, right? And he also uses this to justify um, a very important aspect of Confucianism, right? A Confucianism advocates for a number of virtues. The most important one is Ren or goodness, but amongst the other ones is something called partial care, right? So he actually advocates that you should treat some people as if they are more important than others, right? And so this ends up being a justification for a lot of nepotism, right? It's definitely going to be abused in terms of those five relationships you were talking about, right? Because even though there's an, an interdependence, it's not an equitable system of dependence, right? Because one individual in the relationship is supposed to defer to the other one, right? Um, so he thought that we ought to view morality like this, and we ought to be more partial or take greater consideration of some people than others, because just like the trickle down effect, he also thought of morality as something that rippled out, right? So he thought it starts in the family, right? It starts with your relationship with your parents, which is why you always defer to them, right? And the idea is that if you can learn how to make that relationship harmonious by, right, treating others probably better than you treat yourself, right? Then you will extend that same consideration outwards as you grow in the world, right? And so as you make your way, you know, as you age, you leave the home and you start interacting with your community. And so if you know how to treat your parents well, you're more likely to know how to treat your friends well, right? And your teachers well, and your employees and employees, right? So the idea is as you make your way out into the world, right? Similarly, a ripple effect, but he doesn't think it's possible to start out at the edges, right? We can't just start off caring about everyone the same. He doesn't think that that is in line with human nature. He thinks that human nature is automatically going to have these biases, right? So there's a lot of interesting elements to his philosophy that he accepts just sort of pragmatically, right? He, it's not that he wants human nature to be this way. He just sees it as being this way. And so he's trying to construct a philosophy given the facts that he sees on the ground, right? And so Lao Tzu, on the other hand, is that sort of flip side of the yin yang, right? So if we think of Confucianism as the more active top-down approach, right? Taoism is the opposite, more inactive bottom-up approach. And so who thinks they can tell us um, a little bit more about that? How, how does Taoism differ in this way from Confucianism? There is definitely a greater emphasis on the individual in Taoism. You're absolutely right about that. And it has some interesting implications. So there are two main philosophical figures 
in the origins of Taoism. Lao Tzu is the first one. And the second one is Zhuangzi. And Zhuangzi is a little bit different than his predecessor because Lao Tzu thought that, you know, because we're focusing on the individual, he actually saw society as harmful, right? That society and the kind of constructs that Confucianism wants to maintain at least, right? are the very things that are getting in the way of our ability to interact with the Tao, right? Be one with nature. And so Lao Tzu thought that the ideal virtuous person is someone who retreats from society. And Zhuang Tzu was a little bit different in that he didn't take such an extreme view. He was also a bit more practical, right? In the sense that he thought that we could work on this individual cultivation, but still be a part of society, right? He didn't think it was realistic to think that everyone would just you know, totally disassociate and separate themselves, right, and go live in the woods, as, as nice as that might sound, like everyone is not going to become a hermit, right, maybe we shouldn't even want that. Um, Lao Tzu also thought that, you know, because of the, the knowledge element of becoming one with the Tao, that, you know, you didn't even need to travel, right, he, he talks a lot about not needing to go to distant lands, and Zhuang is like, well, no, people are going to travel, and maybe we want them to, right, so there are differences in these in what this actually means, right, for our lives. But I think the the three main takeaways that um, from Taoism are going to be the first one, which is this sort of skepticism of teachers, right? So the fact that I'm even trying to teach you about Taoism, big no no, right? <laughs> right, it's counterintuitive to the whole idea, right? The idea is that knowledge is not something that is transferred, right, from one brain to another via words, right? Or it, whether they're verbalized or written down, right? The idea is that knowledge only comes from experience, right? And so this is, again, focusing on the individual that can't be trickled down, right? You can't just listen to someone who's above you, right, and trust that what they're saying is the right thing. Right, so a great skepticism of teachers, texts, right, the idea that knowledge is translatable in that way. And one of the other important elements of this is going to be, instead of focusing just on the virtue of being good, right, which is about how we interact with other people, Blaine, you're right, it's a more internal, right, sort of view of virtue in the sense that we are supposed to cultivate virtues like Wu Wei, can tell us what Wu Wei is. It's not quite that. Um, although one of the things that is interesting about this idea that we were talking about earlier, this idea that you can become one with nature, that you can actually, in some senses, Lao Tzu talked about gaining control over nature. And in religious Taoism, that took on the seeking of immortality through achieving oneness with the Tao. And alchemy, which is a precursor for a lot of modern medicine, actually, <laughs> right, was part of this attempt, just using various elixirs, right, to try to change the physical makeup of our body, right, such that it was no longer subject to the rules of decay, right, like everything else in the physical world. And so you see not just meditation, but a lot of um, specifically uh, Tai Chi activities, right, um, acupuncture, right, it's about getting the various complex elements of your body in line with the Tao, right? And uh, in traditional Chinese medicine, every single organ and cell of your being <laughs> is made up of these opposing yin-yang forces, right? And the idea is that for most of us, these are out of balance most of the time, right? And so the only one way to achieve oneness with Tao is to get balance in that. And so alchemy was a way to do that in the religious tradition. So Wu Wei comes from the more philosophical tradition and it means non-action, right? So this is, um, right, if we go back to our discussion of Buddhism, we have that notion of not self, right? So we have some of these like primary teachings that sort of underlie these traditions. Wu Wei is going to be the sort of most important teaching to understand the goal in Taoism, right? How, how they envision right, what it means to achieve oneness with the Tao. And achieving non-action, right, is going to be an example of that. So people who are one with the Tao, right, engage in non-action. So what does that mean? What, what is this non-action business? 
there is an element of doing, right? So it's not doing nothing, right? Just like the not self was not no self, right? This is not no action, right? So you don't get to like, just veg out on the couch and be like, I'm not doing anything today because I'm practicing Wu Wei. Like that's not how it works, right? We don't just get to check out <laughs> of our daily lives, but it, you're, you're right in that it's something internal because it's about the way we go about the doing. So what is it to go about something through Wu Wei, Molly? It's good. So there's a stillness of the mind, an emptying of the mind, right? So along with that skepticism, right? It's about getting rid of things that we thought we knew before, right? Instead of holding on rigorously to things that we think are truth or knowledge, right? Um, and so, yes, yeah, Stella, is that you here in the chat? Yeah, like going with the flow. Or a lot of people who maybe are athletes might understand it in terms of like being in the zone, right? So you're doing something, but it's, or maybe another way to describe it is like muscle memory, right? Like you, you do it out of habit, right? So it's effortless. So obviously engaging in something with Wu Wei, right? Or behaving in line with the Tao in this way, it takes practice, right? It is not something that just happens. Um, one way I try to think about is like, have any of you been driving for like a really long period of time and you realize maybe like if you're listening to something on the radio or just in your own head and you're like, oh my God, I have not been paying attention to the road for like the last 30 minutes, but you didn't crash, right? <laughs> like You never even got close to, right? Like you were totally fine, but your mind was just able to go elsewhere, <laughs> right? And so Wu Wei is like that only without whatever was distracting you, <laughs> right? So getting distracted in the car is not Wu Wei, but, but it's, it's that sort of ability to be in the moment and do a thing very well without having to actively try to do it, right? And so that's what we're trying to cultivate, according to Taoism, is what we ought to cultivate in every aspect of our life, right? Is to engage in this way. And so Molly, you're right that there's an element of something else that we could look at that we're getting again from these other Eastern traditions of non-attachment, right? So something that we saw in Hinduism and Buddhism is that attaching to things that are temporary, right? Are gonna be the source of our suffering, very similarly highlighted in Taoism, right? That if we are so anxious about something that we're trying to achieve, right? That anxiety is much more likely to get in the way of our ability to do the thing well, right? Than it is to actually help us do the thing, right? Um, and this is definitely, you know, something that I have found to be true, you know, in my life. Um, just like, for instance, going on job interviews, right? Uh, I definitely did better on the job interviews that I maybe wasn't as anxious about, right? Because I was just able to give off an impression of being more relaxed. And, you know, part of that was like not planning too much, right? So learning how to put the right amount of preparation into something, but not too much so that, right? Like if I had, you know, stressed every single word I was going to say during a teaching demonstration, then it would have looked fake and practice, right? But there's something good about sort of going with the flow, right? Responding in a spontaneous sort of manner, being able to deal with things as they arise. And so that's, those are the teachings that are going to be important in Taoism, right? And so those obviously can't flourish in a very rig rigorous system, right? A hierarchy in which you have these rules and procedures and rituals that people are supposed to follow day in and day out to govern their lives, right? That is going to be the exact opposite of what Taoism is going to want us to do, right? We're supposed to be um, able to Ideally, what they call it is um, Zuron, which is spontaneous intuition, right? That's the goal. And the idea is that your true spontaneous intuition comes from your human nature, which in Taoism is considered to be good, but not fully good yet, right? So there's a discussion of moral sprouts in Taoism, right? So they're, they're there, but they need encouragement to grow, right? So we need that and we need a good environment for that, but the right environment is not gonna be one that squishes and confines the sprout, right? Into a small little roll, which is what we see in Confucianism. So they're just really two different ways viewing human nature and the surrounding environment such that 
right? One might try to make all of those things come in harmony for one another, right? So for Kongza, it was accepting the reality of that that he saw, right, in the world and trying to achieve harmony within society, right, which he thought in the end would be better for the individual, right? And so Lao Tzu is taking the opposite approach and saying, no, 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 these are the very structures that are getting in the way of our ability to be harmonious with one another, right? These are actually the reasons that we're in conflict with each other, right? These rigorous systems that have been put in place. So, you know, there, there's lots to pull from here and lots of different places it can go. Um, but obviously these are gonna have very different implications for women, right? And people uh, at the margins of society. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, especially in relationship to Taoism, right, is that most people often, right, I would say of all of the world religions that we're going to look at, if you wanted to know, like, a lot of students will ask me, um, like, which one is, like, the least bad for women, <laughs> right, since they're all not great, <laughs> like, which is the least bad, and I usually say Taoism, however... <laughs> That comes with the big caveat. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen this. There's a new documentary that came out on Netflix. I think it's called Orgasm Inc. Have any of you heard about this? It's like one of these new age, like sex positive um, sort of things that turned into a cult and became very problematic. And it reminded me a lot of the parts of Taoism that are usually held up as being the most female friendly, right? Um, the And there are five different versions, right? Uh, and hopefully you got a chance to look at that. Five different ways in which the Tao has been emphasizing the feminine, right? Over the masculine, which is something we don't see, right? In other religions, because the divine tends to be associated with masculine sorts of language, right? Or traits. Um, but it's very easily exploitable. So let's start off by exploring what you know, why we think or why maybe that stereotype that Taoism is more friendly to women, right? Let's explore that. Let's unpack that a little bit and then talk about the ways in which that can still be um, used to harm people, okay? So um, why did, or first off, let's see, did did you all get the impression that, Confuci uh, that Confucianism was less female friendly or did, yeah, okay. So I'm not like totally, right? This is pretty common. So who wants to unpack why that is? <laughs> Why, why do we have these stereotypes that uh, Confucianism is less female friendly than Taoism? Why do we get this uh, perception of it? I was thinking this exact thing. Um, I've been struggling with what seems like two contradictory teachings to me, specifically with regards to women. Um, and that is absolutely, like you said, Taoism's emphasis on nature, right? Which sounds lovely, right? Because who doesn't love nature, <laughs> right? Nature is wonderful. But we also know how nature has been used against women, right? To justify keeping them in a specific role, namely, what role is that? So reproduction, right? Tends to be the role, being a mother, right? Is the, the value right, of female life throughout human history and being the mother of a male, as you rightly pointed out, right, is going to bestow greater status upon a woman throughout history, right, than anything else. So given that Taoism emphasizes nature, I struggle because that obviously means for women that they should reproduce if they're capable of doing so. But there's another teaching in Taoism called, um, it's, oh man, I'm blanking on, on the Chinese term for it, but it means return to nothingness or infinity. And this is what is meant to describe, right, becoming one with the Tao, right? is sort of, again, relinquish, this again stems very much from like the not, not self in Buddhism right? So getting rid of the ego, right? And it seems like in order to detach from, like Molly mentioned, emotions, right? We we're talking about anxiety, sort of the tumultuous nature of reality and society that, right? Lao Tzu talks about retreating from other people. And I just don't know how you can participate in the role that we typically think nature has assigned to women, 
and yet achieve oneness with the Tao, right? They seem incompatible to me, right? And so that poses a problem, right? That means that if it is in women's nature to procreate, right? If that's how we're viewing what it means to be women, and that's not how we're necessarily viewing it, but how others have, right? So if that's how you view what it means to be a woman is to procreate, that seems to preclude you from being able to attain oneness with the Tao, right? So we have the same sort of problem, like Molly mentioned, that we saw in Confucianism, which is those who are capable of attaining virtue in Confucianism, they were called junzas, which literally translated as gentlemen, right? So only a junza could be virtuous. So there wasn't, there were no gentle women, apparently, right? Only gentle men. Similarly, right, if it's women's nature to be attached to reality, right, and attached to other people in these ways, then perhaps they're the implication, right, is that they're not able to cultivate virtue. Yeah, I've been thinking about this. So I really, you know, I, it's not that men hate women, right, or that most men, you know, for generalizing or whatever. I really, I'm trying to get down to the root of it. And I was thinking about the this quote, um, I forget who, who it's attributed to, but um, perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, men are afraid that women will laugh at them. Women are afraid that men will kill them, right? Like these are the two biggest fears that we seem to have with regards to one another. And that was just really baffling to me because like we often talk about like facing our fears and things like this, overcoming them. You can't face a fear of someone trying to kill you without maybe putting yourself in a position where someone might try to kill you, right? <laughs> so it seems only realistic that we would expect the person with the less severe fear to deal with it. Um, but maybe we need to address where those fears are coming from. And you're right, I that a lot of religions attribute men's treatment to women historically, not out of um, a hatred, but out of a fear or perhaps even a jealousy, right, of their ability to create, right? So the very thing that has been historically used against women, right, their ability to procreate might be the very thing that is in fact motivating, right, men's tr historical treatment of women because they wish they had that power, right, is one interpretation, or because it's something that they don't have and, you know, historically we haven't always understood a lot about, right? What do we do when we don't understand something? We're, we're scared of it, right? And so we try to, if it was seen as like a creative power, right? That creating life, that's scary, right? Because we don't understand that power. And also we're sort of jealous that we don't have it, right? So it seems to, to be either one or a mixture of those things. Um, and, you know, maybe over time, some people come to hate what they wish they had, you know, that, that might definitely be a psychological impact of it, but I don't know that the hate is at the root of it, but I think you're right that it's about this element of creation, right? I think there's something there at the root of the tension. And I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Let's see, what do we have going on in the chat here? Okay, a lot of times people have an issue being reliant on someone else. Ah, yes. Good. Yeah, people don't like uh, being reliant on others. Um, and maybe because of the way that we have defined traditional masculinity, right, in order to be a man, you're supposed to be independent, right? And so the very fact that men feel like they need women, maybe, maybe there's some element of a anger, right, in that, right? We, we don't like needing people if, that we don't want to, right? Um, I mean, there are so many examples of this. <laughs> I don't think it's it's too controversial an idea. I think that's definitely part of it. Yeah. This is this is this was one of my other problems with, you know, the way in which a lot of feminists have tried to use the positive elements of Taoism, right? To to emphasize this point. And this, the issue seems to be that it doesn't go both ways, right? That to truly have a balance or unity with the Tao, everyone should sort of be 
right? Theoretically, it seems like everyone should sort of be vying for like gender neutrality. <laughs> Like that should be the goal, right? If we're truly, right? If you truly want to associate masculinity and femininity, right, with yin and yang, right? Well, then being one or having those imbalance would be not really ascribing to either one more than the other, right? But understanding that within one is its opposite, right? That's the other sort of um, emphasis or teaching of the Tao is that these distinctions are really meaningless, right? So it seems weird to highlight one of them over the other since distinguishing them in the first place is apparently part of the problem, right? This wasn't always the case, right? So it wasn't always the case that women, you know, adopting more masculine does seem to be the reverse sort of double standard, which is that women, because maybe because of the sort of work that has been done in feminism and surrounding conversations, right, have really expanded what it means to be a woman, right? Whereas the work is has not been done for as long in terms of redefining and expanding what it means to be masculine, right? And so there's a lot of ways in which being able to break free from those traditionally masculine norms is again, a matter of privilege or culture, right? So some cultures are not going to have the homophobia exhibit itself in the same sort of ways, right? So, um, I'm thinking I also watch a lot of uh, Spanish TV shows and uh, I had my own sort of cultural biases checked at first because, you know, I saw two male characters interacting in a way that I was like, oh, are they going to like make them into a couple? But they were just, you know, kissing and just being much more affectionate than I was used to straight men <laughs> being right in my experience. Right. So, but, the, you know, it shows it's, it, homophobia is not non-existent, right, in other cultures. It just manifests in different ways. But yes, yeah, sometimes that means men are able to dress in different ways. Sometimes it means they're able to engage in certain types of activity, like crying or certain occupations or hobbies. Um, I remember seeing a guy on the bus once that uh, was knitting, and I thought, oh, that's so cool that, like, you know, we're in an age where a man can knit on a bus and, like, not feel like his masculinity is in jeopardy. But then I was like, but this is a white guy too. So, right, like would it probably wouldn't be the same, like, you know, for a man of color to feel safe to do that. So, you know, there are all these other dimensions that are at play that I think we're we're still really trying to deal with. This, you know, ties back into what has historically even allowed women to participate in religion at all, which is that they're sort of the only legitimate reason a woman could give historically for wanting to dedicate their life to was to avoid that very thing right if if the, if you're either going to be out there and become a wife and a mother or right if you can't fulfill those roles then you dedicate yourself to the religion so that you're not a drain on society right or something like this um and stella uh, shared something with me i don't think the whole class saw it but bringing up the read a gross reading from buddhism right about you know if you recall having to the idea that women had to reject their own femininity right in mm -hmm. order to get into the pure land and she mentions the point that, you know, men aren't told they can achieve things even though they're a man, right? Their gender is not um, related at all in their ability to achieve virtue or achieve enlightenment. Whereas for women, it's not only relevant, it's something that has to be overcome, right? And that ends up, again, being tied historically a lot to sex, right? Which is, um, the class unfortunately has ended, but uh, for those who'd like to hang out a little bit, um, we can talk about uh, the ways in which Taoism has been exploited in that way, right? Um, so if we see the yin and yang as masculine and feminine, right? And we're meant to unite and balance them, right, to achieve harmony with the Tao. Well, if you're a woman, what do you need then in order to achieve harmony with the Tao? More young energy? A man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you need that masculine counterpart, right? And if you are a man, then you will need a woman, right, in order to achieve the more feminine qualities, right? So instead of encouraging people, as we've been talking about, to just discover the ways in which they inhabit different gender identities, right? Or different traits that they have. It's more about filling in the missing part, right? And this is where, of course, it, it becomes ripe for exploitation. And I don't wanna you know, keep everyone too long, but um, I, I would encourage you to take a look at uh, this, this documentary, um, Orgasm Incorporated. 
So um, they obviously talk about sex a lot. <laughs> so if that makes you uncomfortable, maybe don't watch it. But I think it's really relevant because you'll see that the leader of this group is a woman and pretty much all the leadership was women in this group. So it was women using the empowerment of female sexuality to exploit other women, right? So it's it's the very opposite of the things that we've that we presume are the sources of these problems and brings up the ways in which women have been complicit, right? And the ways in which enforcing or even trying to celebrate femininity can still be used against someone, right? And so I think, you know, as much as we don't want to put down anything that has been tra traditionally associated with the feminine, right? It's nice to not see those as weaknesses, right? Taoism at least does that. It's important to look at the ways in which that can also be used to reinforce that traditionally unequitable power dynamic, right? So I just, I, I encourage you to keep an eye out for those subtle, they're very subtle, these differences, <laughs> right? Um, so keep an eye out just only for yourselves, right? So that you, you don't, yeah. unfortunately subscribe to something that you think is really about empowerment, but is really used to just indirectly reinforce the status quo, right? So again, that just might be a way of exploring what that might look like today, right? Outside of a religion, although they do reference a lot, she, she rests a lot of her teachings on Eastern philosophies, right? And so that's probably not an accident either, right? How, how are these ideas misused, right? Or is it in line with, with what the actual teaching was? So just a modern day example, but um, otherwise I'll hang out for anyone who has questions. Thanks so much for you guys who came today and I'll see you next week. Yeah, so start with, with, with your thoughts. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good. So first off, I think you're absolutely right that there's something fishy about the desire even, right? Which seems to go against in yeah. my opinion, all of the teachings of philosophical Taoism, right? Uh, again, if this attachment to immortality, right? This desire to control, like these are the opposite of the teachings that, right, we want. Um, so alchemy is definitely an, uh, the result of the more religious interpretations of Lao Tzu. And he does make some references in the Tao Te Ching to people who, when they're able to achieve unity with the Tao, that they, he, he describes them having certain powers, right? Um, in a sense that they were interpreted as being supernatural, right? Like he talks about having um, a lower tolerance for pain, right? And so this has um, manifested in some monks, like demonstrating that they can sit in a big pot of boiling water and, or, you know, there was an individual who, actually self-immolated, right? So set himself on fire and, you know, was in a very deep meditative state at that time, such that he was not responding viscerally to what must have, I, we can only imagine is like the most excruciating pain, right? Um, like he just sat there while he burned, like just, right? So these sorts of powers are what people have looked to anecdotally, along with the references in the text to sort of extrapolate this idea that if you achieve oneness with a Tao, it's almost like you can overcome the limits of the human body, right? And so you can see how that over time is going to become overcoming death. But again, it's very much at odds with other stories in the Tao Te Ching about people dying or people becoming ill and how he very much advocates not even trying to cure the illness, right? And certainly not grieving death, right? So he tells stories about, you know, um, a, a widow who is banging pots and pans around his house after his spouse dies, right? And the point being that like his friends think there's something really wrong with him, right? Um, but for him, like that was just a particular way of showing right? His love for his wife, something about how she loved music, right? Like, so oh. these things that we think of as they're not, they're not the right way of grieving, or you're not feeling the right, right? Like, none of that stuff really matters. But that to me all demonstrates, again, that we should not be so attached, right? To the permanence of life, since it's not permanent. And yeah, in the, in the old Taoist tradition, when someone was 
viewed as achieving um, unity with the DAO, you know, there's a question of like, well, what happens to them, <laughs> right? Like what, so, you know, there's a lot of description of like what someone looks like in their daily activities, right? To sort of indicate this. But the only sort of reference to other sorts of immortality is one myth about, you know, them being at the end of their life, they're carried away by a large bird and they live up in a mountain together somewhere. Like <laughs> there's like that sort of idea, but maybe that's again, just a metaphor or, you know, talking about another realm of existence, you know, it could be a lot of different things, but I'm with you that I don't, I, it seems very much at odds with some of the main teachings. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Uh, there are non-religious examples of, you know, women being able to slay the dragon, as it were. Um, you know, female athletes are just the most obvious example. Like there are things that we can do with our bodies that will just naturally interrupt menstruation, right? Things mm -hmm. like that. Again, the um the and the presumably male... in the past it was easier with worse nutrition. <laughs> Absolutely. Malnutrition is going to be a huge part of it. Yes. Good. Um, the, the male counterpart is interesting though, because it's seen as giving away one's power, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that like you're storing that energy in yourself. That's the, that's the thing is like in Taoism, the purpose of <laughs> stopping these processes is to actually get further away from our association with that gender, right? Menstruation mm -hmm. is associated with femininity, right? So if you stop menstruating, you're not being as feminine, right? So the same thing should apply to men, but you're right. It's being used in the sort of opposite way, right? Well, well it, it's interesting. Yeah, I, you know, there are a lot of interesting ways in which we can positively interpret this, right? Like that sort of thing could be positively interpreted, you know, in terms of trans spirituality, right? Like a religion Ooh. advocating for a intentional changing of one's biological characteristics, right? Especially the sex organs, right? Which is what we have historically used to define people by their gender. So like there, like I'm thinking that there are ways that, that could be used obviously in really positive ways, right? But then again, the flip side is that you are associating a lack of virtue with the presence of those characteristics, right? And so then anyone else who has them and is not interested in getting rid of them or is unable to because, right, like the our physical ability to make things smaller on ourselves is like very limited, right? <laughs> variety of human bodies, right? And the various shapes that they come in. Like this is just uh, like a physical impossibility, right? For people to be able to do this. And so it turns all of those things into something again, that is a sign of your, not only lack of current virtue, but your incapacity, right? To even achieve it down the road. Mm -hmm. Again, I, you know, going back to like what the fear is, like, is it fear that, you know, women have power over men through their sex, right? Like, you know, sex has been used and weaponized against women, but, you know, perhaps it's because of the vulnerability that is present in sexual encounters and the fact that, you know, men are not comfortable being in that vulnerable state or they don't want to give, right, there's something about giving up their power to women or something like this. Uh, so fear, power all, all seem to play a really important role, but... No, and you know, it kind of depends on, you know, your view of s how sexuality develops. Um, and, you know, I personally think there's some rather strong arguments um, to support the idea that even who or who we're attracted to or how we exhibit our sexuality is very socially constructed, right? And so there's room in that sort of view to think that absolutely, right, the structures that have been in place for most of human history will have had an impact on perhaps why we associate homophobia with masculinity so much or mm -hmm. why femininity is um, more open to same-sex encounters. Although, you know, the obvious answer is that, well, that's, it's, it's okay because it's typically been done for the male gaze, right? <laughs> um, or, or it's done for practice. <laughs> or a survival response nope. to like you, there's really interesting evidence of women being housed together and forming sexual relationships with one another right just because of the fact that like they're kept together like, sure. right? like well because it's not consensual uh, you know a lot of the times but 
the idea that even when it is consensual, these individuals don't identify as gay, right? Or having yeah, any sort of like, homosexual encounter, right? They just see it as like, well, no, this is just what was available, <laughs> right? So like, yeah. yeah, the contradiction that, you know, engaging in sex with someone of the same sex doesn't make you gay, but what, you know, who's doing what to whom, right, is going to, it's all- you know, you see this a lot, like reinforced in sports talk with one, like they talk about mm-hmm. homosexual language, right? in any way because they're talking about like dominating someone right yeah that is what's going to make them the loser right so we're getting all of these sorts of negative reinforcements um but then we have this sort of other side as well like where you know if we're talking about men and women women are the objects of sexual desire right and so on the one hand men say they want like you know the pure innocent right virtuous woman but they don't really, maybe sometimes, but not other times. And then they're going to punish the women for being what they want the rest of the time, right? Like there, it's, there's, there's no winning, right? In the, in these roles. <laughs> Witchcraft in particular tends to be associated with um, really like precursors to science, right? And women practicing the art of science, right? Early science and healing practices outside of the bounds, right? Because they weren't permitted to be in those roles otherwise. Um, And of course, we're very opportunistic in who was being charged with such things. Um, Yeah, I'm curious, like, you know, my scientific mind now is like, well, to test that theory, like, maybe we'll have to see what happens, you know, we're starting to be able to grow fetuses outside of any host body, right? Technology is allowing us to do that, I know, right? straight men probably lost their shit like when they find out that two lesbians can have a baby without Hell a male yeah. you know like Hell gonna, yeah. i remember gonna... that <laughs> yeah right like but so i wonder you know what will happen when we see the flip side of that when if men can procreate without women like you know can we maybe they're trying to harness that power you know there's so much there's so much there i i i think maybe that will how much we change in response to those advancements maybe will tell us something about whether or not that was the motivating factor, right? Because yeah. if right, then maybe that was the source of the problem. But if it's well, not, so- fascinating is you're starting to see um, employers offer these types of fertility benefits to incentivize female employees, right? To have your eggs frozen, right? Offering yeah. to cover the cost of IVF, right? And other types of fertility treatments. Um, I, I have a, a friend who, you know, she works for the Gates Foundation and like, it's, it's amazing to me how much they will pay for <laughs> as, yeah. as an employer, like it's all covered, but otherwise you're right. It's, it's, comp- and even with jobs, right. It's, you're going to get that sort of class separation, but yeah, this is not going to be something that's available to everybody. It's got to be like, especially devastating. I, I mean, the words obviously can't even convey, right. But well, like we've been talking about the the status or the thing that might, you know, that they've been striving towards, right, for the highest social status of having a male son and then having that son turn against you, right? Like when you don't have it, the protection of the individual that you'd come to rely on, like, but even when it is present, right, like that doesn't translate to other rights or types of, you know, care be writing more than a paragraph in the coming weeks. So okay. when we get to the objections section, the objections and responses are going to be the most writing um, because you're going to have three different objections to imagine. Each one is a paragraph and then three responses. Um, then you'll have the dialogue, which is going to be less formal writing, right? You're just going to have to write up a report uh, to let me know how it went, summarize it. Um, but you'll be getting ideas, right, for your paper from that. So during that time, you can do some editing. Um, you also will have um, the rough draft, right? Which is you compiling everything together. So it's going to go dialogue, rough draft, and then I think the reflection before the final draft. So like you've got a few okay. weeks where, you know, we'll have just finished like a lot of writing, <laughs> but then at the end, you should have plenty of time to do more editing if you haven't had the chance um, so far. Um, I would definitely first ask if like there's anyone in your life that you've already found yourself chatting with about these ideas or that you are like oh my gosh I know that they would not like this project or right just uh someone who 
you'll be able to get a differing opinion from. Um, and for different people, that comes with different stakes. So it depends on, you know, the people in your life and how comfortable you are engaging in those conversations. I could, you know, make further recommendations if if I know more about the people that you're considering. But um, yeah, a parent, most people choose a parent, a friend, a partner. Um, obviously like the goal is to encourage you to be having these rich conversations with people in your everyday life it could be a coworker, right just whomever <laughs> and they could they just have to disagree with some part of your project so maybe it's just one of your premises and not your conclusion right maybe it's the way that you are conceiving of something although you know if if the person is like not informed on the topic then they're disagreeing with you is probably not saying very much um but also make sure you know make sure you're you're that this topic is controversial enough to be wading into argument is going to this is something that you're going to have to address when, we, when you get to your objections anyways okay the your conclusion what it implies about countries in which women are required to veil just that according to the way that your argument is now at least as as i have seen it lately that is going to be permissible like there's nothing wrong with that according to your premises as you have them to okay. cut you off but um this could mean a couple of things so you can wait and talk about that in your objections right and just say like i'm talking about consent or something like that or you need to add something about choice in your premises which i think would make your argument stronger i a little behind on my grading but it wasn't is, the last the is, for whatever so, I, do you want to change that to women choosing to wear a hijab because i think that's going to be the key to avoiding the problem there's it reminds me of a cartoon uh that i saw i used to use for the class when i used to advertise it and it was a woman in a bikini and a woman uh, they're both looking at each other thinking like you know how oppressed the other one is <laughs> yes yeah. not every yeah no this is something we're gonna get into a lot the veiling of women when we get it to islam as you to go out into the world without being afraid of being attacked right like right. that's part of it right is this is why we end up reinforcing the status quo on ourselves and on each other and on our children right is because even though we don't want it to be that way right we oftentimes are forced to deal with the reality that's in front of us right and so it's like if you want to go out into the world you have to be written and, and survive it <laughs> then you have to be ready for what other people are out there um, and that is the, that's the burden, right? For most people who, whose regular identity is not seen as something that is, you know, safe on its own or okay and undisturbable so, stuff. I mean, I, you know, I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to have kids. And for a long time, I was convinced that I shouldn't and like, you know, my feelings are changing, but the reality hasn't changed. Like the world that, you know, someone brings a child into hasn't changed, even if my desires have. And like, it's really hard to reconcile those, right? Philosophy, right? It's because we, we are not necessarily getting to a resolution, but we're unpacking, unpacking these, these various problems. I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Nietzsche or the, the book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, right? So, um, so Nietzsche is, uh, continental western philosopher but um he was very influenced by eastern schools of thought he's very anti-religious but um really adopts i think a lot of especially taoist ideas um especially like Lao Tzu kind of taoist like he the whole book is of thus spoke zarathustra is zarathustra sort of dealing with this dilemma of like how much to be involved in the world right like how much do i interact with all of these people because as we come to realize there is constantly this sort of battle between being what other people want you to be and being your authentic self right and it seems like we can't successfully interact in the world without always giving up part of our authentic self right like it's always a compromise when we're around other people otherwise we're all just being like egoistic nihilists <laughs> causing other people pain and so like so trying to navigate that and not being able to right so him constantly retreating to the mountaintop right like like i don't know if i can I, you know sometimes you just can't be around people and be compromising yourself in those ways 
Um, and that's the struggle. I'm like, yeah, how much, how much to be involved in the world? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But I feel like if, if there's one thing I, I, one thing positive I can take away from the Eastern traditions is that whether it's enlightenment or virtue or whatever it is you're trying to achieve, it's a lifelong process, right? So it's not ever something that we will arrive at the end at. So that I, whether that's good or bad, I take it as a good thing. Right? So we're not doing anything wrong in feeling the way that we are, right? We are just, this, this is life and we're going to try our best to make the most sense of it and try to make it hopefully as harmonious as we can for as many people as possible. But yeah, there's always going to be that compromise. And so it will be about each of us, right? Deciding for ourselves what, what the best compromise you want to make is at any given moment, right? Because it can change <laughs> from time to time. Well, I have to get, let you guys go because I have another meeting in a little bit, but thanks so much for hanging around and thanks for the recommendations.